we're going to put together a bunch of production concepts. And we're going to do that by introducing a very simple production process in our minds. We're going to imagine a broom factory. Okay. So let's consider a broom factory, first bullet, that uses labor or workers as the only input. So we're going to forget about capital equipment and intermediate goods and all of these other things which are clearly needed in producing something. But we're just going to focus our attention on one of the important costs of production, which is hiring the workers or employees that you're going to need in order to run your business. And we're going to imagine this is so simple that we can just hire people, say, hey, make brooms, and somehow they can figure out where to get the stuff they need in order to produce brooms. Simplifying assumption does not reflect reality, but it's going to get at the essential definitions of terms and concepts that we need to understand to go forward. And so that's why we're making that kind of simplifying assumption. All right, now, imagine or assume that production is characterized by increasing returns to scale at low output levels and decreasing returns at higher output levels. I have not defined these concepts yet. We're going to do so in a minute. We're going to assume that there are fixed costs in production of $200 per day. Uh, I haven't defined that yet. We're going to do that in a minute or two. And we're also going to assume, this is my assumption slide. So this is basically, here's all the basic key assumptions we're going to make as we go forward. Third one is we're going to assume that hiring workers cost $100 per worker, and we can envision per day, for example. There has time period. And we often ignore the time period in our analysis, but there should be one in the end. So I'm going to include it occasionally when I talk about it and introduce it as a day here. Okay, let's go forward. Production schedule. So here's some numbers that are made up. This is from an, uh, another textbook out there, um, and I'm going to just follow that particular example. So let's look at the schedule here on the left-hand side, first of all. And what we've got listed here is different numbers of workers that might be employed to work in this particular firm. And we could imagine, again, the number of workers per day, because there really should be associated time period to the market or to the production process itself. Right? And we could hire zero workers or one workers or two, three, four, five, all the way up to seven. Very simple schedule of workers. All right, now, we've got the output listed here. And again, these are made up numbers that are going to conform with the assumption about increasing and decreasing returns, which you'll see in a minute. Okay, so let's say that these numbers then associate, are associated with the output that will come about when we hire these different numbers of workers. And notice that it doesn't rise up equally or, or at the same rate. It's 20 units for the first worker, 50 for the, in total for two workers working together, 90 for three workers, and so forth and so on. If we plot this particular schedule, we're going to get the graph that appears over here. And notice that the graph is listed as total product. Product is sometimes a confusing term maybe, but what we're talking about is output. The total number of brooms that are actually being produced by different numbers of workers working in the firm. All right, so we've got plotted on the vertical axis the number of brooms. We've got plotted on the horizontal axis the number of workers. And here, I want to highlight that we're now putting different diagrams up, and we've got different things being measured on the horizontal and the vertical axes. All right, so as we proceed through this course, there's going to be numerous different diagrams. You know, when we were talking about Smith and Jones, we had, you know, number of oranges and number of apples on the diagram. Now we've got numbers of workers and the quantity of shin, number of brooms on the vertical axis. In other diagrams, we're going to have number of brooms on the horizontal axis and the cost on the vertical axis, right? And so questions that I ask you on quizzes, for example, on problem sets and so forth, are often asking for you to take note of the units that are being used in these different respects. And that's why a lot of the questions that I ask you will ask you like, you know, not don't just tell me the number for the answer, but give me the units that are being used there. And you have to look sometimes in the problem to figure out, well, what are the units now? We did it one way in class, but we might be using hours now instead of days, or we might be months instead of, of, of days, and so forth. So you have to be conscious constantly of what is it we're graphing and what's being put on the axes. All right, well, if we plot this schedule, it's going to look like this. It rises up and continually increases as we increase the number of workers on the horizontal axis. 
but it's got curvature to it, you'll see. All right, and that curvature is going to correspond to our definitions of a term, in particular to the returns to scale of production. So let's go to that definition. Okay, first, total product is total output of the good. Um, it is a function of, which means it's dependent upon the labor input into the production process. Uh, we could define a production function where we might say Q, a function of L, um, is equal to, you know, F of L, for example. Okay, it depends on the amount of labor that goes into the production process that's going to tell us how much quantity we can produce. Okay, next definition. The marginal product of labor, we'll simplify it as MPL from time to time, and it corresponds to the change in total output given a change in the labor input, okay? Now, marginal, we've used it before. We've talked about marginality, for example. Now we're talking about marginal product of labor. On Wednesday, I'm gonna be talking about marginal revenue. Later on today, we're gonna to be talking about marginal cost, okay? Marginal always means the change in, okay? So these two terms are related to each other. Whenever we say marginal, we're talking about the change in something with respect to something else changing. All right, so marginal product of labor, the labor part is referring to what's changing. The marginal product of labor, how much does product change, which again, product is output, so how does output change when you change the labor input? All the terms are needed are right in there. Marginal product labor. So you're talking about changes in product given a change in labor. It's all in the term. That's all you need to remember what the definition is. Okay, let's do it. Here's the production schedule for the broom factory, again, listed on the left-hand side here. But now we want to calculate the marginal product of labor. So it's given here, notice delta, delta refers to change in. So change in Q divided by change in L. Now, how do we do that? First of all, on the top, we're gonna to talk about the change in Q, going from say this step to this step. Well, the change in Q would be 20 units. All right, and then we're gonna divide it by the change in L. Well, the change in L is going from zero to one, so that's gonna be 20 divided by one, and that's gonna be equal to 20. So the marginal product of labor is 20. But wait a minute, always should talk about units. So if we wanna measure this, we have to say, well, what are we measuring on the top change? The change on the top is gonna to be in brooms. And the change on the bottom is labor, so we're gonna talk about um, workers. So 20 brooms per additional worker, that's what we're saying. So in the first step, the marginal product of labor is 20 brooms per worker. Now, oftentimes, you know, you would say, well, really, it's not at 20 that the marginal product is 20. It's like in between these two. You know, you'd want to put 20 here between these two rocks. Okay, but instead, I just sort of notched it down and moved it to the next rung. And for our purposes here, that's going to be adequate. All right, next step. What's the marginal product of the next set of units? Now, we don't have 20, 21, 22, 23. We've got this discontinuous jump. But we can go ahead and measure the change in the quantity going from the, uh, the second step to the third step here, second row to the third row. And so the change going from 20 to 50 is going to be 30 units, right? And the change in quantity of labor is going from 1 to 2. So 2 minus 1 is equal to 1 again. And so we're going to get 30 units again, 30 brooms per worker. All right, so that's what we do. We keep doing the change, 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 change. And we can add up the numbers and come up with all of the different marginal products of labor at different levels of production that take place within this simple production process. Okay, how will it look? We can, we can go through and we can see the changes as go through. Now, let me just do the third one really quickly. So the third one is going to be 90. That's going to be 40. The next one, because all of these are increments by one unit of labor. So it's really easy. We're just actually measuring the difference between these quantities of output at the different levels. So we're going to go 30, 20, 30, 40. And then the next one is going to be 120 minus 90, which is 30. And then 20. And then 10. And then 5. 
So that's going to be the marginal product of labor at different points along the production process. Now, some definitions. I'm going to say that there are increasing returns to scale. That's going to be defined as the region of production in which the marginal product of labor is increasing. Increasing marginal product of labor. Now, let me, let me break down the term, increasing returns. So what we're referring to with the increasing returns is the additional output that's being gotten by increasing the labor. And labor is referring to the scale. So scale is how big is the operation. And what we're saying is as you add more workers, your production process is getting bigger. Your operation is getting larger, all right? But as you get larger, increasing returns means that the output you're getting is growing even faster. You're getting more returns to the additional scale of production. Marginal product of labor is increasing. Let's go back a step and note that marginal product started at 20, it went up to 30, it went up to 40. So this range right here exhibits increasing marginal product of labor. So therefore, that range has increasing returns to scale, IRS. Now, if I were to ask you, well, what range does increasing returns to scale exist in this particular case, you would say now the range should be measured in output units. So it's going to be between 0 and 90. We know that there's increasing returns to scale in this particular schedule. Okay, next definition, decreasing returns. Same idea, but just the region of production in which the marginal product is decreasing. So notice that the marginal product is positive in all of these steps. So it's positive, positive, positive. So there's always an increase in product or output when you increase labor. But the rate of increase is varying. And if we look now, we can say that, oh, well, notice that from 40 to 30 to 20 to 10 to 5, in this range, we've actually got a decreasing marginal product of labor. So we've got a range where there is decreasing returns to scale. And we could say from 90 to 155 units of output, or we could say from 120 to 155, both of those ranges would clearly be ranges where there is decreasing returns to scale. Okay, so that's the definition. Now there's another one that you need to know about, which is called constant returns to scale. All right, and this is the region of production in which marginal product is constant, neither increasing, decreasing. Let me go back to the diagram real quick. When we talk about increasing marginal product, increasing returns to scale, we're talking about this part of the production curve here, where the curvature is like this, all right? And the slope of that particular line at different points is what's giving you the marginal product. And notice that that slope is increasing as the curve is, is curving upward like that, okay? In this range of the total product curve, you'll notice that we still have marginal product as the slope of that line there, which is going to be positive. But the slope is actually falling as we increase along this curvature. So when it curves downward like this, we've got decreasing returns to scale. And then right here in the middle, there is a range maybe where this is pretty constant, where we've got a straight line almost that's represented right there at the inflection point. Okay, and that would be the point where there's constant returns to scale. Take a look at that diagram. Okay, and again, increasing returns to scale in this segment of the, of the curve, decreasing returns to scale in this segment, and then maybe in here somewhere. There's a constant returns to scale segment of that production function. All right. Now, one reference back to the past. In the second lecture, I presented to you a quote from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. In that particular quote, Adam Smith referred to the, the pin making factory and noted how if you turn person and applied them to the production of pins, well, they could make some pins, but not very many. But if you added a whole bunch of people to the process and you arranged their production process according to an assembly line, giving each of them an individual task, that is, you divided up the labor into individual specific tasks, then you can expand the output considerably. 
All right, and what was being displayed there by the numbers he was presenting was basically an idea of increasing returns to scale. If you add labor input in the early stages, that's actually going to keep adding to output, and you can maybe very rapidly increase output by an enormous amount by adding individual inputs in the early stages of production. Right, and so that pin factory story is a good il early illustration of this notion of, a, of increasing returns to scale in production. But let's say you took that, that, um, that pin factory and you kept adding more and more workers. Uh, you didn't have just 20 workers, you had 100 workers, or you added 150, 200 workers. But suppose that they were all forced to work in the same room, the same small factory space that you had. And when you had 20, they had plenty of room and they could kind of work easily and get the job done. But if you keep adding more and more people and keep crowding tables in together, eventually you're going to end up with what I'm going to call congestion effects. And when congestion starts to occur, you're going to end up with, you know, your pin makers are bumping into each other. They're, you know, they're moving their chairs back and knocking the other person and slowing them down. And, you know, you've just got sort of, you've got too many people in too small of a space. And in those contexts, this is where, this is kind of an illustration of where and when decreasing returns to scale are likely to set in. Decreasing returns to scale will come about eventually because you're adding unproductive equipment, you're creating congestion in the factory space, and the workers just can't work as efficiently or effectively as they did before. And then you keep adding people, you're getting a bump up in output each time you add another worker, but not by as much as you used to. And that's the idea behind decreasing returns to scale. Now, why are we introducing these assumptions like this? The reason is, is because it makes sense that this is the standard pattern you might expect in a production process. That in early stages of production, where that early stage can differ from, uh, from factory to factory, firm to firm, but in early stages of production, as you add workers and inputs, you can really get a big boost to your output. You can, you can grow tremendously fast in your output levels. But eventually, you are, everybody's going to run into these kind of congestion effects. And you can't add forever and expect to get continually, you know, more and more uh, bigger bumps up in your production process. All right. So we're introducing these assumptions. They are introduced because it seems to reflect the realistic patterns that we would expect to see in a real production process. Okay. They're there to reflect reality, in other words. All right. We want to talk about fixed cost next. Next column here. All right, so we're going to assume in the model for our particular example here that there's a fixed cost of $200, but what is that? Well, fixed costs are costs that must be paid even if there's zero output, okay? So even if you close down your gift shop, for example, completely, you know, if you don't own the space that you're running the gift shop in and you're paying monthly rent uh, to the owner of the particular storefront, well, then you close down your gift shop because of a COVID pandemic, for example, but you've got a one year lease on the space that you're renting. And so that means even though you close down the gift shop, you have to keep paying the lease because you've entered into a contract and you've promised to make that payment until the end of the term. So you have to keep paying those so-called fixed costs regardless of whether you're operating business or not, all right? So we're going to imagine that that fixed cost in this broom factory is $200. And notice that we're going to introduce it here and say, well, how much is your fixed cost if you produce zero? Well, it's $200. How much if you produce 120 units? It's still the $2. How, you know, so it doesn't matter how much you produce. You always have this fixed cost that you have to incur. Now, I don't have this on the slide, but I'll just highlight it really quickly verbally which is fixed costs are something that can disappear if you let enough time pass. And I'm going to come back and illustrate that point a little bit more later on. But let me just mention it now. Think about your rent on, on the, the storefront, the example that I just gave you. That rent is likely to be based on a contract, but that contract expires at some point. So if you have a, um, a lease for a year or two years, you're committed to keep making that payment every month until the two years is up, even if you had to close down your business. But once that two years is up, 
Well, now you don't have to sign another contract with that particular company, and you don't have to continue renting the space. So eventually, the fixed costs that you have are likely to disappear. They're going to go away. You can make adjustments afterwards if you let enough time pass. But in the short term, you're committed to those particular costs, and you have to at least extend through the end of those contracts before you can get away from those fixed costs. Now, average fixed cost. All right, we're going to be concerned about average costs of production. And the way we calculate average fixed cost is by the formula right here. AFC is equal to FC divided by the total output in the particular industry or factory. All right, so we've got the numbers right here. And if I take 200 divided by output zero, well, that doesn't make any sense. That would be infinite, and I can't put that number down, so I'm just going to leave it blank. But if I take 200 and divide it by the total number of brooms here, then 200 divided by 20 is going to be 10, right? And so my average fixed cost of production of 20 units is going to be $10. And again, this is in dollars per broom. Keep track of the units. Now we go to the next step and we say $200 if we produce 50 units. I still have to pay that, that $200, but 200 divided by 50 is now 4. And then the next step, 200 divided by 90 is equal to 2.22. Okay, and then 1.67, blah, 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 and so forth. So notice that average fixed costs, this bullet point here, it decreases as output increases. And what's going to happen? Because you always have this 200 fixed cost, regardless of how much you produce, if you increase this output level tremendously, you know, to 1,000 units or 10,000 units, your fixed cost is going to be the 200 divided by that large number of units, and it's going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, so fixed costs, you can reduce the contribution of fixed cost to the cost of a particular unit by producing a lot of units of something. All right, you're distributing those fixed costs across a larger number, and that's why the average fixed cost gets, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And it, it approaches zero in the extreme. Um, so if I could make a billion units of, of brooms, then my fixed cost of $200 is going to be virtually zero. Okay? My average fixed cost, that is. And that's how fixed cost works. Next, variable costs. We're going to assume the variable costs or the labor cost of the production in this broom factory is $100 per worker per day. Now, what is variable cost? It's the production cost of one's variable inputs. That's not really defining it. Well, what are variable inputs? Um, are ones that essentially can be fired. You can choose to hire a particular worker or not hire a particular worker in a particular day. All right, so we can think of the labor input in this broom factory as being not subject to a contract, but subject to just basically the whims of the owner. If the owner wants you to work that day, they hire you and pay you $100 a day. If they don't want you to work tomorrow, they say don't come in and you don't get, uh, the worker doesn't get a salary. All right, so that is a cost that can be varied. You can adjust it based on the circumstances involved. And if you're forced, like by a COVID pandemic, to cut production zero, you can cut your variable costs of production to zero by basically not hiring your workers, laying them off, and therefore not paying them. So you don't incur a cost, a variable cost, when you drop your production down to zero. Okay, but if you hire them, hire one worker, it's going to cost you in total of $100. Hire two workers, it's going to cost you a total of $200. Hire three, $300, and so forth and so on. So your variable cost measured in just dollars is going to be given by total number of workers times the amount you're paying per worker. All right. And notice, if you take number of workers per day, uh, dollars per worker and multiply it by numbers of workers, the numbers of workers are going to cancel out. And we've got a measure, an item measured in just dollars. Variable cost is in total dollars. Now, next step, we can calculate average variable cost, which is also something we're going to need a little bit later on. Definition is given right here. 
at the top right. Average variable cost is equal to VC, variable cost, previous column, divided by the total output, Q. So notice we're doing some things like here, marginal product, we're changing labor on the bottom, but average variable cost, we're changing or we're putting quantity on the bottom, not the change, but the actual quantity at a particular point. So keep track of these definitions. Fixed cost, we're putting quantity on the bottom, not labor. So how do we, we take the variable cost, zero, divided by output, zero, well, nothing's there really. But if we take the next step, $100 divided by the total output, which is 20, 100 divided by 20 is going to be equal to 5. Next step, 200 divided by 50. Well, 200 divided by 50 is going to be 4 and so forth and so on. Go to the next step and we can plug in all of the numbers for the average variable cost of production. Notice the units. The units of average variable cost is in dollars per broom. Variable cost is in dollars. Quantity is in number of brooms in our example. So the ratio is gonna be dollars per broom, the units. Notice the following. Notice, go back to average fixed costs. Average fixed costs started up high and then fell continuously as we increase the output. But average variable cost follows this pattern. It starts up at 5, falls to 3.3, and then rises back up again. So it is described as U-shaped. Right? Starts up high, comes down, reaches a minimum, and then rises back up again as output increases. All right, and that's what we would expect from the simple example. That's what average variable cost will be. Next step, total cost. All right, total cost is really easy. It's just the sum of fixed cost and variable cost at each level of output in the economy. So I've now gotten rid of the labor column over here. Forget that. We don't need that anymore. We're going to put relationships for our purposes, and we're going to graph everything except for that total product curve above, we're going to graph everything relative to the output of the product in question, so output of brooms here. All right, so when we measure total cost, we're going to imagine that total cost is a function of the quantity that's being produced in the economy, Q. Okay, total cost is a function of quantity. All right, how do we get it? Well, we've got to go back to the previous slide and just say, okay, we're going to add up fixed cost plus variable cost to get total cost. So the first row is going to be 200 plus zero is 200. The second row is 200 plus 100, 300. The third is 200 plus 200, which is 400. And that's what I've got specified here. Okay, total costs are rising as quantity increases. And in fact, it rises at a constant rate. All right, but it is... It is, starts out at 200 when the quantity of brooms is zero. Next variable, average total cost. I'll use two different terms, and this will be true across textbooks too. So some textbooks will talk about ATC for average total cost. All three terms are listed. Sometimes they'll just talk about average cost. And if they talk about average cost, it means average total cost. So either of those refers to this particular variable. How do we measure it? Well, it's right up here. Average total cost is equal to total cost divided by the quantity produced. And we have that right here. 200 divided by zero is undefined number, so I'm going to not put anything there. 300 divided by 20, that's going to be equal to 15. 400 divided by 50, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, that's going to be equal to 8, right? So again, this is 300 divided by 20. This is 400 divided by 50, because we're just going to match these up and take one number divided by the other number to get the measurement of average total costs. Okay, got it. So here's the numbers worked out, 15, 8, 5 5.5655, 5.33, 5.81. Okay, now note, illustrate, average total cost falls initially, this range, and then it rises. So falling with output increasing and rising right here. This is going to turn out to be our definition of these terms, economies of scale 
and diseconomies of scale. So the definition of those particular terms relates to the shape of the average total cost curve. When the average total cost curve is falling, like it is here in this range of output, 20, 50, 90, we're going to say that there are economies of scale. And when the average total cost is rising, as it is in this range here, we're going to say that there are diseconomies of scale. Now, real quickly, where do these terms come from and how to make sense of them? When we talk about economies of scale, we're not talking about like, you know, the U.S. economy and the British economy and the Chinese economy. No, we're talking about economies as equivalent to savings. And that's another usage of the term economies, right? So you economize on something, you save. So economies of scale are referring to savings that arise because of scale. And scale here means the size of the factory or the firm. And scale is, in, is becoming bigger when you have more output, right? So economies of scale then means Am I getting savings as I increase the size of my production process? And the answer is yes, when average total cost of production is actually falling. All right, now remember, average total cost is taking all the costs to make however much you produced, and you're dividing it by the number of units of output. So what you're really doing with average cost is you're getting a per unit measurement of the cost of each good, right? On average, across the entire production process, it costs me $12 to produce a widget, okay? It costs me $8 here to produce a broom if I produce 50 brooms. But it's going to cost me only $5 to produce each broom if I produce 140 brooms. Hence, I get savings in the cost of production as I increase the scale of production, economies of scale. That's what it means. Now, diseconomies... You know, there is no kind of saving word that's very common. So you know, somebody at some point just decided to put the dis for not in front of it. So you've got diseconomies of scale, meaning the opposite is true. Um, you're losing money. It's becoming more expensive to produce a good as you increase the scale, in this case, beyond a certain point in this range here. All right? And that means you're, you're, it's costing you more. You're not getting savings. You're getting dis savings. It's costing you more instead. All right, now notice that the ATC is also a U-shaped curve. It goes down and then it comes back up again. It's going to have a minimum, like here, at $5. All right, and that's just the pattern of production, the pattern that we're likely to see with an average cost curve. Next one, marginal cost. These last two concepts, by the way, average cost and marginal cost, are undoubtedly the most important concepts we're going to use here because we're going to come back and use those principles or concepts over and over again in terms of making speculations about decisions made by individual firms. Okay, now marginal cost. Just look at the name itself. What are we referring to? Marginal means change in. Cost is total cost of production. So what is the change in the cost of production? But we have to say given what? So it's the change in the total cost given a change in the output level. All right, so once again, we're going to say that marginal cost is a function of the quantity that's produced in the particular market. MC function of Q, put it in parentheses. All right, but marginal cost is going to be asking the question, how much does the total cost change when you change the output level? All right, well, let's calculate it here real quick. And here, we're going to talk about average total cost, and we're going to talk about change in total cost. So we're talking about this change here, given a change in output, which is listed here. Okay, so the first marginal cost evaluation is going to be the change in total cost is 100 units, moving from 0 to 20, to produce 20 units. And that's going to be equal to 5. Now, what are the measurement units here? It's going to be in dollars per broom. Don't have that listed up there. I should, but that's the measurement units for marginal cost. We're going to measure it that way because we've got cost is in dollars. Quantity is in numbers of brooms. Take the ratio of it. It's in units of dollars per broom. Next step. The next step is another 100 units, but the step here is 30 additional units of output. 
So the next step is going to be 100 divided by 30. And that's going to be equal to $3.33 per broom. Here's the numbers calculated for all of the individual steps. Notice that marginal cost falls initially, then increases. So therefore, it too is U-shaped. Starts higher, falls to a minimum in our example here of 2.5, and then rises back up again afterwards. All right, and that's the patterns we're going to see if we have the particular assumptions that we've made previously. How are, we, how are these going to look? Okay, these are the diagrams you're going to have to get used to. And here is a production cost diagram with three of the important elements drawn. The most important, like I said, is average total cost here and marginal cost. And notice, I've got average total cost is a U-shaped curve. It starts up higher, and I, I didn't plot this explicitly using the numbers that are drawn in the previous um, schedules. Instead, I've drawn this just conceptually. Like, we know that average total cost falls, reaches a minimum, and then rises up again. So here is a U-shaped average total cost curve reflecting that. Average variable cost follows a similar pattern. It's going to look like very much like the average total cost, although actually it's going to get closer at this stage, and I didn't quite draw that, but don't worry about that. It's going to be also U-shaped, reach a minimum at some particular point, and then rise back up again. And then marginal cost is actually going to be similar, but it's going to have a slightly different character to it. Notice how the U is drawn a little bit narrowly here. And what's going to have to happen is that the marginal cost has to cross the average variable cost at its minimum. And it's going to cross the average total cost also at the minimum point. Um, I can get into a little bit of why, but let me just get through these points for the lecture today. Okay, but that's a regularity that's always going to be true given the nature of the assumptions we've made about cost structures here, all right? And it's something worth noting. So here, I've got it listed. Marginal cost is equal to average total cost at Q bar, okay? They're equal to each other. They cross each other at the minimum. And if marginal cost is less than ATC, then Q is going to be less than Q, so it's going to be down here. And if marginal cost is greater than ATC, as it is here, then the quantity has got to be greater than the Q bar minimum. Okay, and then the other thing that we can identify on this diagram is that if we're anywhere to the left of the minimum, then average total cost is falling. Okay, it's going downward. And that's what we define as economies of scale. Anytime we're to the right of the minimum of average total cost, then there's rising ATC. And that corresponds to diseconomies of scale. So looking at the diagram, we can use it to kind of distinguish different areas of uh, possible production levels and whether economies or diseconomies of scale is going to be relevant or valid. 